I want to say uh, welcome everyone uh, to the speaker series of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. I'm uh, Executive Director Catherine Wilhelm. And our subject today is Japan's strategic interests in Taiwan. We're having this conversation about a month after the presidential and legislative elections in Taiwan, which were watched very closely around the world because of concerns that the election outcome might uh, exacerbate the tensions that have been rising across the Taiwan Straits between China and Taiwan. And even uh, has been a lot of talk about the potential for active conflict in some form or another in the not too distant future. Uh, many of the conversations that I was hearing after the election and the form in which we often hear this issue of Taiwan's future discussed is a triangular uh, conversation or triangular relationship between uh, China, Taiwan, and the United States. And the central question often becomes what the US will do and the degree of resolve in Washington to maintain the status quo across the straits and to, if necessary, uh, defend Taiwan's uh, autonomy. But today we want to shift the angle of focus and ask, what is the view from Japan? Uh, Japan is of course geographically a near neighbor to both China and Taiwan, particularly close to Taiwan. And as we are going to discuss for the next hour, it has a real stake in the future of Taiwan. So to explain this, we are thrilled to have with us uh, Yuki Tatsumi, who is the director of the Japan program at the Stimson Center and co-director of the center's East Asia program. Uh, she was born in Tokyo and educated in both Japan and the US. And she's an informed and insightful analyst of the US-Japan Alliance, of Japan's uh, diplomacy, its national security policies and regional geopolitics. So just to give you a flavor of some of her work, a few of her recent publication titles have been uh, Lost in Translation, question mark, U.S. Defense Innovation and Northeast Asia, and also a series of Stimson Center publications called Views from the Next Generation with, um, with uh, entries in the series titled Balancing Between Nuclear Deterrence and Disarmament, Peace Building and Japan, Japan's global diplomacy, Japan's foreign policy challenges in East Asia, and so on. So you can see that today's conversation is squarely in her uh, wheelhouse. Uh, before joining S Stimson, uh, Yuki was a researcher at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and she also served as a special assistant for political affairs at the Embassy of Japan in Washington. Uh, you can see her full bio on our website. So Yuki, welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us. It's been two years since you last were part of our speaker program. Uh, for any uh, anyone in the audience who didn't catch that conversation, uh, it was April 13th, 2022. You can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm excited to have you back. And um, in order to uh, keep this program very concise, we only have an hour because we're trying to squeeze this at the end of the U.S. day and the beginning of the day, new day in Japan. We agreed to dispense with uh, opening remarks and go right to uh, the tough questions. So I'm going to get the conversation going by raising some questions, but I want to invite the audience members to please be active participants and write your questions into the Zoom question queue that I'm sure you all know by now. And as I see these questions come in, I'm gonna to start to read them out as well. So, so my first uh, question, Yuki, uh, is just to help us set the table for what we're gonna talk about when we say uh, Japan's strategic interests in Taiwan to explain for us what those interests are. Uh, when, when Japan is monitoring the rising tensions across the Taiwan Straits, when it is uh, analyzing the results of the Taiwan elections and so on, what are the risks that um, Japanese analysts are looking for uh, to Japan's own interests? And when I say risks and interests, I mean both of these broadly defined across the whole range of, of possibilities. And then as a part two to that question, what are the policies and the measures that Japan 
has taken or is talking about taking to try to contain the risks? Well, thank you, Catherine, for that question. Um, and then also thank you, NYU USA Law Institute, for having me back to your webinar. I enjoyed the uh, my uh, first appearance with your uh, webinar uh, speaker series uh, a couple of years ago. And one of these days, I'm going to, I hope uh, to be in there in person. Yes. So uh, we'll see that. We'll see how that goes. We'll make that but, happen. But um, in answer to, um, in response to your questions, Catherine, um, I think um, Japan really have a deep interest in the uh, peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. And uh, whatever the, uh, the uh, issue between PRC and Taiwan, uh, whether that may be reunification, how their future, um, that will be resolved peacefully without, um, without any use of force. And the reason is very simple. Um, it's, it's geography. Hmm. Um, Taiwan, um, Japan's uh, most Southwest Island is very, very close to Taiwan. Um, if you go there, if you go to one of those islands that are in the southwest, south, southwestern island chain, on a good day and a you know clear vision day, you can see Taiwan, like mm -hmm. island of Taiwan, from that island. So, whatever could happen um, that are um, that involves the uh, armed uh, tension between Taiwan and PRC, uh, Japan always has a deep concern that it could quickly escalate into Japan's own national defense issue because it is so close. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, uh, Japan does host um, sizable U.S. military forces um, in uh, across the uh, U across its territory. And between Taiwan and the United States, it does have a Taiwan Relations Act where depending on, you know, if the, uh, if the if the uh, crisis breaks out across the strait and it is not provoked by Taiwan, um, United States has an obligation to help Taiwan defend itself from armed invasion from the mainland. So when that happens, it's, you know, you can, you know, I don't really have to go into like all kinds of military operational details, but you could see that you could easily uh, foresee a situation where something like that happens. U.S. forces going, you know, to help Taiwan defend itself in that kind of circumstances go through Jap Japanese territory and all these U.S. military bases across Japan. So it is not far-fetched um, scenario to see that um, if you're in a conflict, where would you hit? you would hit where the threat comes from. And a lot of the time, you know, you know, most of the times in these scenarios, it is US bases across Japan. So you can see why, how Japan see that uh, any conflict or rising tensions across Taiwan Strait could quickly escalate into Japan's own national defense issue. So that is why it is very, very important for Tokyo to make sure that the peace and security, you know, stability across Taiwan Strait is maintained. And now uh, Japan, obviously, like the rest of the rest of the world, monitored um, how the uh, Taiwan presidential election would turn out for the mm -hmm. last several months. Um, and obviously, you know, Japan uh, considers Taiwan as a fellow democracy. Uh, Japan has a very favorable um, affinity toward Taiwan, very friendly uh, partner with Taiwan. Um, and uh, Japan um, government in Tokyo will be happy to work with their government or you know President Elect Lai um, mm -hmm. on the uh, on the uh, many initiatives that you know whether that might be public health, disaster relief, um, how to counter disinformation, so on and so forth. And obviously, Japan and Ta um, Japan and Taiwan has enjoyed decades long of a cultural, and economic, and people-to-people -people ties and exchanges. But um, at this current point, uh, Japan really looks at how um, government in Beijing may react leading up to President Elect Lai's uh, inauguration coming up in several months. And uh, 
Japan is ready to make sure that uh, this tension is not getting out of hand. If you look at uh, Japanese national defense strategy and national security strategy that was released in December 2022, it does state that uh, Japan Japan put places one of the uh, most uh, priority in ensuring that uh, peace and stability cross strait is maintained. That it is in it is in their deep national interest. So it is work. Tokyo has been working very closely with the United States and other fellow uh, fellow democracies around the world to make sure that uh, you know whatever the tension that may arise between Taipei and Beijing will not get out of hand. That uh, they will they will not be escalating into an open armed conflict because it's not it's just not that it's not good for Tokyo, but it is really not good for the entire world economy. So that's where Japan is uh, looking at. Hmm. So I want to ask you later to, to to explain a little bit more about exactly what they're doing to make sure the tensions don't get out of hand. But but before hmm. we, we go to that, um, it would be good also to just lay out now at the beginning of the conversation mm-hmm. what the uh, the nature of the contacts are between the governments of Japan and Taiwan. So you, you spoke of... Uh, there being an affinity toward Taiwan, of Japan considering Taiwan a very friendly partner. Um, do the government the governments, of course, don't have formal diplomatic relations because in 1972, Japan um, s- stopped having diplomatic relations with the Republic of China and Taiwan and opened relations, established relations with the People's Republic of China in Beijing. So like the United States, it closed its embassies in in Taipei. Uh, The US followed uh, in 1979 with the same move. So so there's no formal relationship. So what is the nature of the contact? How do the two governments communicate with each other and and at what level do they communicate? So that is a great question. Um, You mentioned about um, US side of the Yalek too, how when US switched its diplomatic recognition Nation from Taipei to Beijing, um, it closed this embassy, but at the same time, it opened AIT. Mm. Um, very similar with Japan. So Japan, yes, Japan did close um, embassy of Japan in Taipei, but in in um, in in lieu of that, it did open up a Japan Taiwan um, Exchange Association office, mm-hmm. very similar to AIT for us. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, often it's led by the uh, recently retired um, senior Japanese diplomat. The uh, current uh, representative, for example, is a very seasoned um, Chinese linguist mm-hmm. that um, that is very well versed both um, on the uh, both sides of the uh, both sides of the strait. And uh, it basically looks very much like AIT. That uh, if you don't think, you know, it looks very much like embassy, but it is not a formal embassy mm-hmm. because of um, uh, unofficial nature of the uh, Jap- Japan's relationship with Taipei. Mm-hmm. But, and like I said, you know, it is very similar to AIT. One thing that's missing, though, is that um, United States here, uh, we do have a time relations act that um that uh, have a more you know nuanced uh, definition of how this uh, unofficial relationship works like um when um united states may come to uh, come to help taiwan's defense and things like that which japan does not uh, currently have mm. that said within the last several years uh legislative exchanges between japanese uh, diet members and uh Taiwanese legislative yuan members have been increasing. Mm. Um, I think it was last year or the year before that the uh, uh, that the uh, dialogue between the uh, members of Japan's uh, ruling Liberal Democratic Party mm. um, begins uh, begins its dialogue with the uh, their legislative yuan partners and a counterpart in Taipei. Basically, have a very open ended discussion about you know where does our relationship lies. Uh, where do we have a shared concern and how can we open up the uh, avenue mm-hmm. for more cooperations? Because Japan, like the United States, it does take a one-China policy. 
So PRC is the official diplomatically recognized diplomat official diplomatic uh, diplomatic um, diplomatic partner hmm. for Tokyo as well. But hmm. at the same time, um, Japan does have unofficial relationship, primarily based on economy, cultural exchanges, and people to people exchanges. And you know, on a personal level, um, Taipei is a one of the one of the most favorite um, tourist destination for Japanese, you know, regular citizens for a long weekend, for example. Mm -hmm. So it is a, a, you know, before BTS came along, it was a toss up between Taipei and Seoul in terms of where Japanese uh, Japanese people go for a long weekend. You know, it's a mm -hmm. short two hour flight. Right. Um, you know, they have a friendly, you know, uh, friendly destination to go to. So, you know, those uh, people to people ties are very deep. and. For Japanese, um, Taiwan's greatest gift, as I always say, is the uh, best um, professional baseball player of all times. <laughs> so, and you know, Jap you know, for Japanese, baseball is a national sport, so it speaks volume. That's right. That's right. Those connections really matter because they cement in the minds of many people uh, more than than specific policies sometimes do. Yes. To to what extent does um, the history uh, I don't want to because I don't want to ignore this kind of elephant in the room. Yeah. Possibly, to what extent yes. does the history help or hinder um, having uh, the kind of conversation that we're having now about Japan's interests, its stakes in Taiwan? I mean, Japan, of mm -hmm. course, was um, the colonial power in Taiwan for half a century, eighteen ninety five yes. to nineteen forty five, um, and uh, that is, of course, increasingly distant. There are fewer people who would remember that. Uh, yes. And and have you know active ill will as a result of that, and yet it's there in in, in the past. So when when there are conversations in at, in the government or in the in the in the diet in Japan about what stance Japan should take toward Taiwan, does this past become a shadow hanging over that conversation? Is there any sense that any action we would take? Via V Taiwan, it looks as if we're reasserting some kind of colonial interest, or is it the opposite that actually we have we should have take this interest because we have a responsibility? Or does right. history pl play into it? So, as far as I know, um, of course, Japan has this uh, colonial role history. Uh, Taiwan, uh, Korea, mm -hmm. and parts of Southeast Asia, and I would um, I would def I would describe a a uh, colonial um, Japan's colonial governance time in Taipei is actually better story to be told um, because there are less, so much less ill will mm. toward Japan from people in Taiwan. And you go and you know people, if especially if you um if you encounter with the older generation, like elderly generation, they're happily speak to you in you know they're happily speak to you in Japanese mm -hmm. once they figure out that you're from Japan, mm -hmm. which you do not see in you know Korea, for example. Mm -hmm. So it is one of the greatest mystery in a Japanese history that how you know. Do, Compared to how Japan did in Taiwan, obviously Japan, you know, Japanese colonial governor at that time must have done something semi right mm. to have that outcome in Taipei, whereas the outcome in Korea is so polar opposite. Mm. So that is one of the greatest mysteries. Like, you know, what is the difference? What is the dividing line? Mm. So um, that is a backdrop. I think the uh, short answer to you is um, history is less of a factor when you talk about Japan, a contemporary ta japan taiwan relationship and it's really more about uh japan and taiwan's uh, shared value and their belief and uh, their commitment to the uh, democracy and how japan within the confine of uh, one china policy how japan would be might be able to support taiwan to gain the uh, voice in international space whether that may be WHO or that whether that may be the um, you know ICAO, the uh, airline safety you know international organizations, so I think you know I will probably leave at that. Mm. So that actually is is a good way to come back to the question I kind of put on hold a few minutes ago mm -hmm. about you had said that Japan works with other democracies to try to 
uh, alleviate tensions, maintain the status quo, ensure that there isn't a conflict. And so I'd like to maybe unpack a little bit about what it's doing. And is, mm -hmm. is what you just said about trying to help Taiwan gain voice in international space at WHO and other international organizations where Taiwan, as we know, has not been has generally in, the, in recent years, especially been less and less been allowed to participate uh, mm -hmm. because uh, the People's Republic of China has objected to Taiwan participating um, because it's part of its policy of insisting that Taiwan is not a state and therefore does not meet the qual does not qualify to be there. So is is that support for Taiwan on the international stage? Is that part of trying to maintain the status quo? Are there other components to the strategy of trying to maintain the status quo? I think that um, for you know Taiwan and um, several different area, you know, airline say, you know, air travel safety, public health are the two, you know, issues that are come to my mind right off the bat. Um, Taiwan is a uh, helpful player in that field because obviously, you know, Taiwan plays a really good role in a public health realm. Obviously, Taiwan's Eva Air travels in, you know, flies its air, you know, flies its flight internationally. So even if a statehood is a requirement and therefore Taiwan may not be the full-fledged member, um, Taiwan could still uh, play a use, you know, helpful role as a, a you know, in the observer status of those uh, arenas. And then I think Japan, Japan has been historically support, very supportive of Taiwan remaining an observer and active participant in those fora. Um, and then I think in addition to that, um, I think uh, especially from uh, late uh, former Prime Minister Abe took office in uh, 20, tw uh, late uh, tw the end of uh, 2012 and his uh, successive, successive successors, Prime Minister Suga and the incumbent Prime Minister Kishida, they all consistently talked about the importance of peace and stability across Strait, um, across Taiwan Strait, not just for Japan's national security, but then also for the uh, East Asia writ large, but then beyond. Um, just a specific example, but you know, Taiwan is a powerhouse when it comes to semiconductor reduction. So if if the uh, flow out of the uh, island of Taiwan regarding that realm is disrupted we all get affected by it, right? I mean, we will have to wait for longer to buy our new cars, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of closer to our kitchen table issue. But then, but then also, you know, cell phone, you know, cell phone, computer, you know, our laptop, you name it. There are a few modern technology that can function without advanced semiconductor, which, Taiwan has overwhelming production capacity. So even from that kind of a selfish kitchen table issue, mm -hmm. um, it is in, I, I believe, everyone's interest. Make sure that that, that parts of the world remains stable mm -hmm. and tension doesn't rise and get out of hand. And, and I think Japan, Japan welcomes recent engaged, renewed enthusiasm and uh, coming out of Europe. You know, you we start noticing that uh, European countries or EU or Europe, you know, European count, you know, Council of Europe starts sending more delegations to uh, exchange, and of course, everybody's that relationship with Taipei is unofficial, mm -hmm. but um, having those delegations in Taipei, meeting with, you know, president and other senior members of their government, really speaks volume as to their support as well for Taiwan's democracy and the way that in and that uh, Taiwan's uh, their support for Taiwan remains democratic as it is now. So what what is the Japanese playbook for maintaining peace and stability um, in in Washington? The debate is often over uh, how much should be said versus what should be done. In other words, there are some mm -hmm. people who would say, well, let's not talk a lot <laughs> about mm -hmm. what we would do in the case of this scenario or mm -hmm. that scenario, say right. less, and just be prepared, invest more in armaments, uh, help Taiwan to uh, arm itself. 
uh, help them to be militarily ready, make them a porcupine so that they would be an unattractive target. So there's a lot of emphasis on, on the military preparedness and readiness, and then some debate about should the United States drop its policy of strategic ambiguity and just say right. flat out very clearly, no, if Taiwan is is uh, attacked, we will, you know, do such and such, mm -hmm. right? Which it's always insisted, you know, is an is is an open question. We we haven't right. said uh, officially. You know, the U.S. government has not said so. That's the debate, and that mm -hmm. but those that's kind of the universe of the prescriptions generally. How much mm -hmm. to say, what to say, and. Right and emphasis on rearmament. So in Japan, is it, are those the prescriptions? Is there a different playbook for how to maintain this peace and stability? Is there another approach? I think playbook is very similar and that it is more delicate in case of Japan because mm -hmm. it is geographically closer both to mainland and Taiwan compared to the United States. Mm -hmm. That the balance that it needs to walk on mm -hmm. is so much more nuanced that mm -hmm. I think the bulk of the debate is about let's not talk too explicitly about what we may or may, may not do, but instead let's uh, look for, um, let's explore ways in which Japan can support Taiwan's democracy without, you know, advertising it, but advertising with fanfare. Mm -hmm. And uh that said, though, I think Japan is actually playing a catch up in terms of um, types of the communication it could have, especially in the case of um, emergencies. Mm -hmm. um, I think if something happens, you know, whether even if it's like not military, let's say there's like a natural disaster, happen, you know, God forbid, there's mm -hmm. no such case. But both Taiwan and Japan has seen its uh, healthy dose of a natural disaster hitting their own, you know, respective islands. Mm -hmm. So if something ha like that happens, let's say tomorrow or like next week, right? So how does Japan communicate directly with the uh, appropriate authorities in Taiwan to, you know, starting from how to how to take account of uh, the uh, whereabouts and the accounts of uh, Japanese citizens living in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So there are businesses, there are students, uh, aside from the uh, their unofficial representative office, right? Mm -hmm. So there are there are things that uh, Japan still need to figure some of those out, uh, which I think they are really intensifying their efforts to uh, rectify. Um, but I think the playbook is very similar, but I would just say it's far more nuanced because Japan is very closer. There's so much more, it's so much closer to Beijing. So it always has to, you know, they get the, re, you know, Tokyo gets a repercussion first before Washington gets it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that is always on their mind. Right. So a number of the questions have, have started to appear in yes. the queue and they, the focus of them is about the, the military angle. And of course this is, mm -hmm. um, one of the, the the key key things that you had uh, begun by highlighting yes in any military conflict clearly you know okinawa <laughs> is in the crosshairs uh all yes. the us bases there um so what what do we know about um the planning or the understandings that may exist uh, are there any understandings uh about what would happen if China took aggressive action against Taiwan um, and the US wanted to use forces on Okinawa to respond? Or another possibility is that China's planning aggressive action and because it anticipates the US will use its forces on Okinawa, it decides to have a preemptive strike against the US forces on Okinawa, which of course is a strike on Japan. Right. Um, what do we know about um, understandings or arrangements mm -hmm. between Japan and the U.S. about what to do in that kind of a scenario? So between U.S. and Japan, there is the uh, cooperation of uh, defense uh, guidelines for the defense corporations. So in the minds of Tokyo, the latter uh, scenario that you laid out, which mm -hmm. is Beijing might attempt the uh, preemptive, if you will, Mm -hmm. strike against the uh, U.S. forces in Okinawa, that actually makes it simpler for Japan. 
Mm -hmm. because as you mentioned, it is a direct attack against Japanese territory. Mm -hmm. Then it is a national defense emergencies for Japan. So all bets are off. Uh, Self-defense forces will be fully mobilized um, as if it is it were direct armed, um, you know, military invasion attempt against Japan, mm -hmm. um, which is trickier will be the first scenario that you laid out mm -hmm. that um, it looks like, you know, they their um, a direct impact is kind of stops at Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But because of the convention, maybe, you know, it's it's an unprovoked action against Taiwan. Mm -hmm. emanating from the uh, generated from the uh, Beijing. But because it is unprovoked by Taiwan on the U.S. side, Taiwan relations as gets um, enacted that U.S. wants to go to um, Taiwan's defense. In that case, um, U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, Bilateral Treaty, they have a regional emergency clause, which is Article 6. Um, and uh, there are a host of things that uh, Japan is authorized to do based on that um, secure, um, bilateral security treaty arrangement with the United States. So that includes providing United States the logistical support, um, rear air support, basically not anything that are supporting um, US operations outside of Japanese territory mm. um, will be will most likely be authorized. And what is actually even trickier, which is the uh, focus of the debate amongst Japanese defense planners and also Amer you know, US defense planners is what if some of those either preemptive or anticipatory action coming out of Beijing does not take, does not take the shape of the um, brunt uh, kinetic military action. So mm -hmm. what if some of those actions were cyber or sabotage um, mm -hmm. attempt against Japan's electron, you know, Japan's uh, power grid mm -hmm. or U.S. forces power grid? You know, it is very difficult to kind of pinpoint where that emanates. From. Then what you do. And then I think that is that is a. That, that are the, the types of scenarios that uh, Japanese government and U.S. government have been uh, trying to hashing out where this legal authority comes from. How do you define that? That is an you know, armed, that is um, equivalent of armed attack against either U.S. or Japan. And then, you know, how, how do you get, how does it get certified? How does the uh, following the uh, actions by Japanese government, including the uh, supportive operations by the self defense forces might be authorized so that's really the uh, that's really the uh, focus of the discussion right now if it's a kinetic explicit front force it is actually simpler because there are very clear cut guidelines of how what types of uh, what types of article gets um, gets triggered and then there are uh, menus of things between the uh, between two countries or what types of defense uh, defense cooperation it takes and what is the what is more challenging is what about these uh, gray zones that that are what are the uh, more of a disruptive oper operations that are not military forces? Mm -hmm. Is how how much to your understanding? And I, I, I realize you may not know all of the um, um, understandings that have been made um, in in uh, behind closed doors on this, but how much of this has been thoroughly hashed out? in advance between the US and Japan, to what extent do the two governments have, are they clear in both what they individually expect and to do and what they expect the other partner to do? Um, I, what, what gives me pause is the thought of some scenario where the attack uh, is made, as you say, a gray zone type thing where there's a cyber attack mm -hmm. or something else, perhaps even there been, there's been discussion about, you know, various kinds of economic um, aggression mm -hmm. and embargoes that is a very coercive in, effect on Taiwan. And then in the moment, at the heat of that moment, when, of course, there'd be all of this media clamor and everybody would be under a great time pressure to take action, that mm -hmm. the U.S. and Japan would be working out, well, how do we read this clause? <laughs> and, right. you know, what do we do? Um, 
is is this still being discussed? Is or is are there, to your knowledge, clear understandings about, you know, how the what the response would look like? So I think, like I said, um, when it comes to a very kinetic nature of mm -hmm. the actions, I think it's simple. And then I think both sides have a fairly clear understanding mm -hmm. of when, you know, how the sequel or the sequence of events will, mm -hmm. will roll out. Mm -hmm. And what is uh, what is actually in the topic of discussion, and I hope mm -hmm. that they're getting to the better clarity, mm -hmm. is the uh, latter. That, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about, we talked about the gray zone, we talked about economic coercive action. If it's economic coercive action, you know, there are you know, there are venues like, you know, especially if if that coercive action doesn't only target Taiwan, Taiwan right? Mm -hmm. If those uh, economic supposedly coercive in, with a coercive intent, mm -hmm. the action is also targeted at Japan or the United States, whether that may be in the form of embargo of some of the, you know, some of the uh, critical minerals or materials, that uh, that they you know that Beijing you know that that's exported out of you know mainland against those you know toward those two countries have been suspended or there are there could be other types of behaviors where Japanese businessmen or mm -hmm. American businessmen get detained for kind of unfounded espionage you know espionage like sus suspicion or you know allegations or something like that i think that is the uh that is still i think there are less clarity on how i think there are clarity in terms of you know japan and united states unilaterally react to those kind of things but then at what point uh two countries determine that okay these things are correlated with mm -hmm. what's going on on the ground mm -hmm. so therefore joint action may be necessary i think there are I, my suspicion is that um, there are less clarity on those mm. um, aspect of the uh, escalate and you know, what could be potentially escalatory ladder. Mm. Uh, about I, I think it was ten years ago when um, when uh, Prime Minister Abe was in office, he reinterpreted Article Nine of the Japanese Constitution, uh, mm -hmm. the article that addresses what kind of um, military forces Japan may have, um, you know, the renouncing war clause. And he said that he introduced this concept of a collective self-defense. So, so uh, my understanding, uh, the, according, and I'll rely on you to correct me, but that on Article 9, Japan should use force only in its self-defense. And uh, the concept of collective self-defense allowed um, Japan to cooperate with other countries who that was somehow aligned uh, with Japan, uh, for example, in um, military exercises and the like. Does Taiwan fall within Japan's definition of self collective self-defense? Would it? So would it, hmm. that's a great question. Um, the, in, from my understanding and it, of that reinterpretation of the Article Nine is that uh, there are specific. It's not necessarily geographical in mm -hmm. terms of those uh, reinterpretation has been done, but it is very much more of um, how do I say this? Conditional and the uh, judgment um, bar comes to this one point where if Japan does not do certain things that also includes the mobilization of self-defense forces to support US or its other friendly partners, security partners. Um, it, will, it will turn into Japan's own national security crisis. Those are, so I guess situational is the word that I was looking for. Mm. So it is not necessarily geographical, but it's more situational that uh, um, judgment um, pers you know, judgment line is if we don't do anything because at this point it doesn't directly turn into the uh, direct military attack against Japanese territory. But if we if we sit on it and just kind of sit idly by and don't do anything in terms of supporting U.S. and other Tokyo's um, other you know friends and partners. It will 
mm. affect Japan's own national security, then Japan is at that point、um, allowed to exercise this right of collective self defense. That is a reinterpretation that the Prime Minister、um, that that happened under Prime Minister Abe's watch.、Okay. So there are, I guess.、Um, I, so I would say there are more situational as opposed to ge-、um, geographical. Right. But、um, but you know, given Taiwan's proximity,、um, whether ge- geographical or situational, you can easily see how that could fit into that definition, that condition. Of、um, that will allow Japan to exercise that right, right? Because if you don't, you know, if if Tokyo kind of doesn't do anything, it will, it will、um, quickly escalate into its own national defense crisis, right? Right. And、so、that is why I think,、um, yeah, more and more, I, I think、uh, pl- uh, legislators start talking about、um, prostrate crisis. Is not regional contingency. It is Japan's own national security emergency,、mm. and I think that is a shift in their perspective. Kind of, you know, kind of ra- if rather belatedly, but still better than ne- you know, better late than never. Kind of awareness that、um, how close these situations are, you know, geographically. To its own territory, because you know we often forget this, just because a lot of these are small islands that belong that falls under Japanese territory. Many of them are un un in you know not hit you know not uninhabited islands, but they're still Japanese territory, right? So any of basically this、um, security threat against any of those islands, whether there are people living on those islands or not. Is Japan's own national security crisis, so I think that is a there is a, there is a kind of a rather belated awareness of that、mm-hmm. situation and how close some of those islands are、mm-hmm. to the、uh, Cross Strait, the Thomas Strait. So one of the questions, of yeah. So one of the questions raised by the audience was a very sort of blunt、uh, phrasing、mm-hmm. to say if Taiwan were invaded, right. Would、mm-hmm. what is the view in Japan about using the Japanese military military to support Taiwan,、uh, either with the U.S. or alone? I guess to, to kind of wrap up what you've just been saying, it sounds like your、mm-hmm. answer is maybe. You know, so if, Japan in the right will, in the、Japan、right circumstances. Probably, yeah.、Um, so how do I say this? So if Taiwan is invaded, what preceded that invasion will be、mm-hmm. very important.、Mm-hmm. Would、uh, was there Taiwan's、um, I guess unilateral declaration of independence that happened?、Mm-hmm. You know, that's one condition. And even United States, I think, is iffy on it. <laughs> you know, if Taiwan out of the blue decided to unilaterally decide to declare independence out of、mm-hmm. as a as an independent nation,、mm-hmm. um, would that be、um, unprovoked attempt to change the status quo across the Taiwan Strait?、Yeah. Um, but minus that, without those unilateral,、um, in, you know, declaration of independence from Taiwan, and Taiwanese wake up and face PLA coming onto their shores, which is big, clearly, which is the more of a case of unprovoked military invasion.、Uh, um, it's. Hard pressed to see Japan to go on the front line together with the United States to defend Taiwan,、uh, help、um, help defend Taiwan. But I would definitely see this as a case where Japan would support、um, U.S. military operations that will deploy to Taiwan to help Taiwan defend itself. Mm-hmm. To repel those invasions,、mm-hmm. and those support will include,、um, will include something like you know not just logistical support and re you know refueling and supplies and so forth, but it could also include、um, assisting evacuating not just Japanese citizens but U.S. and other you know other democratic countries citizens in Taiwan out of the island. Back to you know, kind of back to the rear area of the、uh, of Japan to its、uh, supposedly like you know safety. Right. 
So one last question I'll, I'll relay uh, from the audience about the military side, and then I want to talk a bit about the economic ties aspect, economic risk. But th this other question is, what about the um, Japan's current um, increased in defense spending, military spending, which um, it announced uh, several years ago, um, yeah. a plan to ramp up spending pretty dramatically. Um, and uh, the question is about how is this going to be financed. Um, right. There was a proposal, I guess, to increase taxes, but that's been delayed. Mm -hmm. um, so can 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 the government actually follow through with this promised increase in defense spending? So for now, it looks like what's very different about this uh, Japanese government uh, announcement a couple of years ago about increasing its defense, its defense spending over the next five years. And by now, I think by this year, we're in like, you know, year, we're about to enter like year three, I want to, you know, year, year, year three, I want to say, is that many of those increase has been front loaded, mm -hmm. as opposed to in the past, they say, yeah, 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 we'll spend this much in five years. But then so much of the spending was kind of back, um, back spend. So they were like, you know, pushed off to year three, four and five. Mm -hmm. But this time, their commitment was to front load those, um, for example, you know, whatever the new capabilities, whether that may be um, starting, jump starting the um, jump starting the uh, pro acquisition process of their um, counterattack capabilities or co-development of the uh, glide phase interceptor for their, you know, as a part of their ballistic missile defense program in the United States and so forth. Those expenses have been uh, front loaded that um, it doesn't have to wait for those tax increases to hit. So I'm in the camp to say um, those spending patterns tell me that uh, they are more serious about following through those commitment. I mean, I'm not saying that they weren't serious before, but they were more committed to make sure that their five year uh, five year defense um, plan. Mm -hmm. um will be executed mm -hmm. so um yeah mm -hmm. so and then i agree those questions are healthy that's what i always you know ask my friends in japan also is like and how mm -hmm. does how does this year three four and five you know spending will look like mm -hmm. but um so far um i will take the cue from them front loading some of those uh initial costs right right Okay, so let's, um, with some of the remaining time, sort of switch gears and talk a bit about the economic relationship because the economic relationship seems really important to Japan with, that is the relationship with both China and Taiwan, right? China is Japan's top trading partner uh, and Taiwan is Japan's third largest trading partner. Um, so both of them are, are super important. You highlighted the semiconductors, of course, coming from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a, a unique and very important, uh, economic connection. Um, so at the same time that Japan has been uh, concerned about potential risk from, from Chinese aggression and the tensions across the strait, its businesses continue to conduct business and trade and so on and investment right. with both, uh, mainland China and, and, and Taiwan. So how does the government at a policy level think about managing this risk. Uh, and and here, we don't even need to have the kind of military action that we were talking about. It could be something much less, simply having um, China imposing some kind of economic sanctions mm -hmm. on Taiwan or economic blockade of Taiwan, which uh, happens has already happened. The sanctions have happened a number of times already. How does the Japanese government thinking think about responding to the to economic aggression from China, say, and right. the, and containing that risk, the impact of that risk on its own economy, uh, part A, and then part B. What? How do businesses think about this? Are they trying to de-risk? Uh, you know, to use the term that um, the the European Union uh, right. innovated. You know, about tr them trying to de-risk their exposure to to China. So I think um the two words are like de-risking and mm -hmm. friend shoring. And for a while now, and then I would say it start it 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 began even way back 
better, you know, far farther back than mm-hmm. a, a couple of years ago. Okay. I think you really, um, if you recall, um, I think it was uh, 2010 when um, Japanese uh, authorities um, arrested the uh, captain of the uh, fishing boat that uh, that were like you know, water gunning at the uh, Japanese Coast Guard ships and ramming itself against a Japanese Coast Guard ship. Um, China responded by suspending the uh, ex- export of its uh, rare earth. Oh, right. Yes. And mm-hmm. and then also which followed by detention of, you know, Japanese businessmen in mm-hmm. China. So that was kind of a wake up call for mm-hmm. uh, Japanese businesses that has operation in China that um, reminded them of the risk mm-hmm. of uh, maintaining the uh, operations in China. Mm. And and I think since then, you know, it's really, they really haven't really advertised this change, but then they have really started de-risking by moving the uh, production hub out of China, for example. You know, many of them has moved, you know, start looking at uh, countries in Southeast Asia as a transfer destination. And also um, they are looking beyond China for um, other functions of their businesses. So I think a de-risking and French shoring had been ongoing for Japanese business as a whole um, for you know over a decade now, I would argue. It just that it hasn't attracted much attention because with the given the sensitivity and they have to walk fine line between maintaining a you know maintaining a relationship with both Beijing and Taipei um, they really haven't openly talked about it but then I think they have been doing that quietly as their risk management that's mm-hmm. one thing and the um, other thing is that um, they are they are de-risking I think by investing more of their efforts into a more a multilateral framework, right? Is if you call when United States pull United States pull itself out of the TPP, what did Japan do? CPTPP. Mm-hmm. Right. So those um I think Japan is looking at those multilateral trade frame trade and investment frameworks as the um as a part of the uh, safety net that um that um I guess a soften the uh, soften the potential blow mm. from those tensions. And uh, it is, I think, including United States, uh, complete decoupling is really not neither realistic nor feasible. So it is really the matter of how you, re, you know, how you um, reduce the risk. Mm. So Japan has been doing that. It just that it's been very quiet. And then I think in the last couple of years, ever since, um, this uh, supply and chain resi- resiliency, especially in terms of uh, critical materials and advanced technologies, um, they have been they have really start cutting back on exports of related um, product into China. So their export to China, um, I guess, has been kind of a, on a downward spiral, but it still has a very healthy dose of uh, imports from China. So you know, it's uh, it's the both side of the ledger. Mm. Is the reduction on exports to China something that is happening at the business level, the firm level, where an individual company is shifting its market attention, or is it the result of government policy that is discouraging exports to China? Or have there been, for example, uh, rules put in place to screen out certain kinds of exports or sales? Um, I think um, it is probably it's probably more accurate to dis- describe it as uh, kind of it, it depends on the sector oh. and we also have to we also have to remember that you know COVID restrictions um, had a lot of um, ha- had a un, um, had an important role to play in it too mm-hmm. that when you know you have a country that used to be a huge trading partner goes into a complete lockdown that you know your people cannot travel back and forth Thus, no business and you know interaction can go back and forth between. Then you know results will follow that there are less um, less transactions. Mm. So I think uh, it kind of started that way, and then I think it got um, it got kind of a that trend line has been pushed 
um, by this con general concerns about how uh, Beijing could weaponize really mm -hmm. its uh, economic uh, prowess to coerce other countries into um, into um, kind of ill to the uh, goal that uh, Beijing government and Beijing is looking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we see that, you know, we do, we, you know, Japan did see that in the uh, countries in Africa or Latin America, where they had that investment, you know, investment agreement or infrastructure investment agreement, where many of those countries um, begin to switch diplomatic recognitions from uh, type, you know, some of those countries started, you know, switch the yeah. diplomatic recognitions from Taipei to Beijing. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, playing out in our, you know, in front of our eyes as we speak. Mm. So. So I think we have time maybe for one last question. Um, and I want to ask about the uh, degree of alignment between uh, the government uh, in Japan and in, and in Washington, uh, the U.S. government, on how to try to maintain the peace across the strait, how to try to best support Taiwan. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've you said a couple of times that the approach in, in, in Japan is a, is, is a more low-key approach. You, I think you use that uh, description for both the business response, you know, the idea that decoupling mm -hmm. or de, not decoupling, de-risking is going on, but it's low key, it's not talked about. And also that, um, that you know, steps are t being taken by Japan to try to elevate uh, and, and support Taiwan on the international stage, but doesn't talk about them a lot. So it's a more low key approach, which is in keeping, I think, with the overall diplomatic stance that Japan has tried to present to the world. Is there is that just a difference in style, or is there substantively mm -hmm. some a difference in you know in an, a, an assessment of the risk, perhaps, um, uh, an assessment of the urgency of the risk, uh, or of the best way to actually sort of manage uh, relations with China and manage the whole situation? Does does the government in Japan feel that it actually has some better solutions or approaches that you know, maybe Washington should think about. I think um, combination of all those elements that you mentioned, I think mm -hmm. um, it, you know, one of them is, you know, it's certainly Japanese, style, you know, diplomatic style of, mm -hmm. you know, it's that seem, you know, that tend to side on the view that, you know, some things are more effective when it's not talked about openly and not done with like a great fanfare with a headline making. Um, the other thing is, I think I alluded to earlier in our conversation that the geographic proximity that Japan has is very different from United States. Mm. Um, you know, between the United States and where Japan sits, there's a big body of water called Pacific Ocean. Japan doesn't have that luxury. So whatever the impact of the rising tension across the strait, Japan feels it first and more intensely. So thus um, lends itself to a little bit more nuanced and you know, oftentimes quieter approach. Mm -hmm. And even when it comes to economic size, for example, you know, Japan is probably that has a less capacity to absorb some of those shocks yeah. from rising tensions across the strait or um, coercive behavior coming out of Beijing compared to U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. So all those kind of a circumstantial differences results in the uh, diff you know sometimes you know often considers like a different approaches. Mm -hmm. But I think at the bottom line is I think U.S. and Japan does share a, share a uh, purpose. And ensure that uh, they found it, and it's in their very um, critical interest that um, cross strait relations remain stable and uh, resolution of uh, differences between Taipei and Beijing will be resolved peacefully without either side um, kind of resort to uh, unilateral actions to um, change the status quo, mm -hmm. that those issues are resolved peacefully and are based on the uh, di diplomatic um, transaction mm -hmm. as opposed to coercive behavior or provocative behavior 
from either side. Right, right. So I, I think we have to leave it here, but this has been, uh, thank you so much, Yuki. This has been a fantastic conversation. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, and I, I've learned uh, a number of very important things from you that uh, I think the audience uh, will agree have been valuable contributions to the larger conversation uh, that will be going on for the rest of this year as we go into the U.S. election, where Taiwan will also be, you know, not on the ballot, but will be in the debate uh, in a very major way. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you also to the audience for joining us and for your excellent uh, contributions to the questions. and. Um, we hope to see you next time. Good night. Good night. Thanks for having me.